everyone. Welcome to the STOA, uh, developmental tasks of the final stage of life. Our friend Susan Campbell is returning. Uh, if you're just being introduced to Susan for the first time, she's an author of various books, including Getting Real, 10 True Skills You Need to Live an Authentic Life, and her more recent book, uh, From Triggered to Tranquil. Uh, and Susan, um, the past guest uh, at the STOA, and she reached out and wanted to have a discussion on the practical and philosophical dimensions of the growth work required um, for us who want to live intentionally uh, to the very end. And uh, that's what this session is going to be uh, about. And we're here for 90 minutes to two hours. Uh, uh, there's no rush today, so you can come and go as you please. This will be posted on YouTube. And I'm basically just going to hand uh, the still over to Susan, and uh, she'll take me back at the end. So Susan, welcome back to the Stella, and the Stella is yours. Oh, you're on mute. Okay. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be here. And thanks, everyone, for coming. I want to um, mention that I'm going to be asking during this presentation uh, for show of hands on various questions. So it would really be nice for me, and I think for the rest of us, if as many as possible of you would be on your screen, would have your video on. Or if you're <clears throat> you know, doing something where you don't want to have your video on, maybe you could at least turn it on for the show of hands activity. So I'll, I'll be mentioning that. So that's my request. And feel free at any time to write comments or questions in the chat. I may or may not pause to consider those but at the end, we will have a, a Q and A uh, and hopefully a discussion, because I have I still have a lot to learn from others about this topic. It's not something I've presented on before. This is my first time putting something together on this topic, and I had to ask myself when I sat down to make some notes: Is development still going on at my age? <laughs> Of course, that's a joke, but you know, it's like, is development going on or is this about it? And uh, I, I do really think that this is an exciting stage of development, actually. It's a, it, I'm, I'm going to say it's like a real page turner. Um, I am at a kind of a stable kind of a place. I'm, I'm, I haven't lost a lot of function bodily yet, but there's, um, I'll, I'll try to share these as we go through some of the different topics, but um, there's a, a lot of new awarenesses coming up for me. And one of the reasons for that is I took three months off this June, like this month, July and August, to write my life story, make a perhaps a book out of it, but at least it's giving me a chance to reflect on my whole life and to kind of see where I am now. It's kind of a life review. And whether it gets published or not, I think it's a wonderful process and I do want to recommend it. So that would be one of the practices that I will be mentioning again as we go through this. Before I get started, I want to get an idea of who's here in terms of your age range. So would you give me a show of hands is there anybody here under the age of 30? Would you, you know, raise your hand, it's whichever way you like to do it, your physical hand or the one in the Zoom reactions? Anybody under 30? Okay. All right. Well, anybody between the ages of 30 and 40 here? Okay. A couple people. How about between 40 and 50? Mm hmm between 50 and 60. Thanks. Between 60 and 70. Looking good. <laughs> between 70 and 80. Cool. And anybody over 80 like me? Okay, one. Oh, no, I think there might be two. Well, this is great. We've got a pretty good age range. Um, 
I'm going to share my self-talk is like, okay, so people under 30 maybe aren't that interested in this yet. I, I know I sure wasn't, uh, although I was always interested in development. So the whole idea here is, in fact, my whole life has been encouraging people to be interested in their development. So I guess that's kind of in the background why I want to, to offer this. So I want to start by just saying something about where one's, and on my own, um, expectations about this stage of life came from. And it probably is the same for most of us, watching our parents age, possibly watching our grandparents age. And my father died what I thought was fairly early. He died at 82 and he was in great physical shape and mental shape too. He just had pancreatic cancer and he just died three months after the diagnosis. So um, that was really sad because he wasn't ready. My mother died at 97. And so she had all those years without her life partner from, they'd been married like 60 something years by the time he died. Um, so I got to see that. I got to see how a widow navigates her life without the partner. And I got to see what that's like getting that old where you can't get up off the floor, you can't walk, that sort of things, that, that sort of thing. But she still at the end, she still had all her cognitive faculties and she still had a great sense of humor. So um, I think it was kind of like my expectation then that I'll probably be fairly healthy when I die, that I probably won't lose my cognition, but um, I definitely did watch my parents, you know, lose some function. So I, I just want to mention that so that you guys also can reflect on what are your expectations about that final stage and where did they come from? And a, a big teacher was actually my grandfather on my father's side. I don't know how old he was when he died, but about the last 10 years, he got kind of paranoid and I, I was in my 20s when he died, and I remember thinking to myself, man, if you don't do your inner work before this stage, you're in trouble. I, I kind of made that a real vow to myself to not let that happen to me. So you may have some negative role models, too, that you learned from. And just reflect on that. What's motivating you what's motivating me to be even interested in development toward the end here. And developmental theory in general pretty much states that if you do the lessons of the early stages of life, like if you learn how to communicate about differences, if you learn how to accept the realities of your life, if you learn how to really get on to how the mind works, how the ego mind works, and can kind of let go of some of your need for control, can open up a little bit more to uncertainty and ambiguity, that if you do some of these developmental tasks early in life, your older age is going to be easier. And so developmental theory in general always states that. Do the work now and make your life easier in the future. So I wanna um, give you kind of an outline of what I'm gonna be covering today. I have a screen share here, just a one page. Now it says here, host disabled participant screen sharing. Can you help me out with that, Peter? You should have it now. Now, okay, here we go. So this is going to be just a list of the topics. I'm not gonna keep this up very long, but just to give you an example of what we're gonna be dealing with today. 
So I've divided up the developmental tasks of this final stage as lifestyle issues and then inner development issues. So I've got those in slightly larger typeface. Just take a look here. So some of these are pretty darn obvious, especially the, the lifestyle ones. And then the inner development ones will be a little more challenging as we look at those, I think. So that's that's my agenda for today. It looks like a lot here. So we'll see how the time goes. So the first thing that probably all of us have already dealt with somewhat is loss of function and both physical and perhaps even cognitive. And the thing that I'm dealing with right now with regard to loss of function is something I want to invite you guys to uh, consider too. It's how hard do I work to maintain this function? Like to maintain the, the ability to do 20 girls push-ups. Okay, so, you know, it's always been, I can do 20 girls push-ups, probably one man's push-ups. <laughs> um, but what, you know, what's, what's the value? Of, of that and how hard do I work to be able to continue to jog or play tennis versus saying, you know, I think I'm gonna save, like for jogging, I'm gonna save my joints for um, walking. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of conserve a little bit and not stress these things too much. And that's a, that's a, re that's a real live issue for me right now when it comes to loss of function, because you can, I mean, you've seen these pictures of these 90 year old weightlifters probably. And you go, okay, I could do that, but do I wanna work that hard? And so it's, for me, it's a very live issue right now. And I just want to ask, ask you guys to think of, is there anything that you have consciously given up for example, tennis, jogging, skiing. See, we can still, I can still swim and ride a bicycle, but I don't jog tennis or, or ski anymore. And those were decisions based on, hey, I'm going to save my joints, that, that type of thing. So how about you? Show of hands. How many people have consciously given something up? You didn't have to, but you said, you know, I'm going to save, I'm going to save this. See a show of hands on that one. Uh huh. Okay. And so as I'm seeing this, I'm I'm thinking. Either you're too young, maybe you didn't ha you, you you haven't stressed your you're not just not stressed yourself that much to begin with. Um. So I'm, I'm just kind of using this as research to see wh wh what the next questions are that are gonna that are gonna come up for me here. So I thank you. I thank you for looking into that one. Um, there's also so loss of function. Let me just see if there's anything else I want to say about loss of function. Well, I mean there's a lot we're gonna we're gonna hit on loss of function throughout this presentation because loss of function eventually might lead to loss of independence. And that that can be really scary for people. So I'm assuming we're all hoping to be able to walk and see and that sort of thing. And, and all of us here are still are still lucky in that way. So I want to take a moment and just give some gratitude for how lucky I feel for still having pretty much all the basic functions working. And maybe there's a function that you have lost that it wasn't through any conscious decision. It, it just went. And notice how you feel about that. 
So grief is another piece of one of these developmental tasks is learning how to feel something at loss, around loss. Now, another common loss is loss of beauty. And, and, and that doesn't just mean your face, it's like your skin, your hair. Oh, women my age, we joke, and I guess, I guess men do too, but I, I haven't heard it coming from men, that we have hair where hair never used to be, and we have no hair where we'd like to have hair. You know, there's, there's that kind of thing. Uh, so loss of beauty doesn't, doesn't just mean facial beauty. And so there's some decisions that people make around that. And there's feelings that come up. One decision is, do, do I do some kind of um, cosmetic procedure, cosmetic surgery or Botox or something like that? Do I start adding a lot of accoutrements like makeup and stuff like that, that I didn't bother with before? Uh, or maybe I've always been a person who really values that kind of stuff. Or am I a person who kind of prides myself on what people call growing old gracefully? Like, I'm not going to do that. So the, the thing I'm bringing this up for is the decisions you make around that kind of thing often are related to some kind of identity, some kind of identification with your looks or with youth. And see, this stage of life almost like forces us to surrender certain things, forces us to let go of identification with some of those things that our ego really liked having before. And to me, this is not a bad thing. Loss in this way really is a preparation for death. So I, I just want to see if there's anything else about that. No, I think I'm good. I'm good with the, the loss of beauty one. Um, I want to go to loss of loved ones. And this happens to all of us at various stages of our life. But at this stage, it's going to start happening more often. It probably already has for a lot of you. I know one of the reasons my father stopped playing tennis was his buddies died. People he used to play tennis with. So he was able right up until the end, but he ran out of, of male friends who could do that. And for me, I haven't actually, other than my parents uh, and oh, my youngest brother, I haven't actually had a lot of loss that of people who were real close to me. And my brother actually chose his death, not, not exactly with suicide, but he was on dialysis and he, it was just too, too painful, too difficult to stay on dialysis for so many years. And so he just went off dialysis and had a, had a very peaceful death two years ago. So when people are ready, like when my mother was dying, she was ready, my brother was ready, it, it just seemed like such a different experience than when my father died, because he was, seemed so, so vital. When he was dying, I, I went home and got in bed with him, and I, I says, Dad, you've got a better body than most of the guys I date. <laughs> And he was got such a big smile on his face, but I'm 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 just I was just so sad that he was so full of life and joy and wanting to do more things, and he got his life cut short. So I'm sure that some of you know situations like that, and those are the really tough ones, at least for me. It's when the other person's not really ready.
Then there's the loss of independence. And that's the big dreaded one, I think. And the ability, it goes along with that, is the ability to accept help. So even now, how are you at asking for help? Have you been forced to go through something where you have had to learn this? And, and how have you learned it? Is this something you really dread if that were to happen to you? Have you thought about making your house wheelchair accessible and that sort of thing? I'm really resisting that myself. My partner really wants to do it. So these issues are up for me. But loss of independence is probably that and loss of your primary partner that you've been with for a long time. When I was doing a little bit of research for this talk, those are a couple of the biggest fears And I want to um, kind of check in with you about some of your fears. I'm going to do another survey here where I ask a show of hands. And I've got a, a list of some of the most common fears that were mentioned as I was uh, reading up on this topic. So how many people, you know, show of hands, how many people fear dying alone, that that's an active thing you really don't, don't want? Dying alone. Show of hands here. Okay. Thanks. How many people fear being put in a nursing home or having to go into a nursing home? Maybe by one's own choice, that's your only option, something like that. But you you have fears around that or negative thoughts around that. I want to really see this. This is, a, this is a this is a big one in the in the friends that I have. They have a lot of um, fears about that. When I say nursing home, I mean also assisted living, that sort of thing. How many people fear that your partner, even if you don't have one right now, but your spouse or your primary partner dies before you do? How many people have that fear? How about this one? My spouse, my spouse or my primary partner becomes disabled and I'm the main caregiver. Now that one's up, that one's a little bit up for me. Not my partner's very healthy, but that's up for me. But I don't, I wouldn't personally probably raise my hand because we have so much supportive family around. So it wouldn't be just me. So that's another thing to think about is if that were to happen, what other support do you have? Because being the primary caregiver is pretty tough. How about this one? How many people fear all my friends die before me? Or I think I might raise my hand for that one. Mm -hmm. How about running out of money? This is happening to a number of my friends right now. They've um, been involved with these Ponzi schemes. And it's, re it's really a serious thing when you're 80 years old and your life savings is gone. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. How many people fear running out of money? How many people fear um, not being able to see or hear? So I guess, I, I don't know if it's an active fear for me, but I... I would definitely not want that to happen. I've got friends who already can't see. Yeah. How about can't walk? How many people fear not being able to walk? Uh -huh. Yeah. How about this one? Can't get up out of my chair or off the floor. You know, we may laugh now. In fact, 
I went through a phase where I could, couldn't get up off the floor. Uh, when I, I had some periods of disability in my life, even though I'm healthy now. Uh, and that's a real thing, not being able to get up off the floor. Yeah. How about this one? Anybody ever fear, had the thought or have the fear that I'm stuck with a partner that I can't stand? That's sort of the opposite of fear of dying alone. I remember my uh, former husband when we got divorced. We we had a fairly contentious relationship at, at times, but also with a lot of humor. And he said to me, Susan, I'm so afraid of dying alone. And I said, Brent, I'm really afraid of growing old with somebody I can't stand. <laughs> now, maybe hard to put yourself in the shoes of a relationship like that, but that was the kind of relationship we had. Hmm. How about losing your sexual potency, desire, or opportunity? How many people uh, can admit to that fear? Raise your hand. And depending on how long we live, a lot of these things will be taken away from us and we will be forced to surrender to who else am I? Who else am I when I don't have my beauty? Who else am I when I can't handle penetrative sex? You know, you can always handle some kind of sex, but um, a number of women at a certain age can't be penetrated anymore. And that's a big deal in a relationship, that change. Here's my final question. How many people fear I'll be in chronic physical pain? I would say that's probably my biggest. Yeah. Now, all of these fears are just normal, you know, normal things that humans who have a who have a self and who have had a, a self that works pretty well all these years now are starting to have parts of that self, that identity taken away. So is this a gift or a curse? And I guess that's that's one thing we want to consider when we get down to the inner development issues. But first, before we go to that, I had one more couple, no, I had two more items on the lifestyle losses or the lifestyle developmental tasks. And one of those is um, learning new ways to meet my physical affection needs and my sexual needs. And there really, uh, there really are a lot of people who just stop having sex, but then there are other people who have a lot of affection and touch and kissing and getting turned on with each other. Uh, my partner and I, we, we really like dirty dancing as a prelude to our, our version of sex, which involves some penetration, but not like it was before. Um, there's a limited time there in, in my case. And fortunately, my partner's not overly um, identified with being having penetrative sex. But most most of my girlfriends are in about the same situation that I'm in. And sometimes their partners are more um, attached to penetration, and sometimes they're not. And this is a communication issue then. So one of the main issues here is being able to really listen and look at options and just, just try things out uh, and even grieve together if that's if that's the issue. I, I haven't actually felt the need to 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 grieve. I like it's kind of been so gradual for me. So when changes are kind of gradual, I I think you don't realize maybe what you've lost. Or honestly, there's also another thing that um I'm experiencing as a, an elder, and it's sort of a been there, done that. You know, I had my day, 
that has to do with sex, that has to do with travel and seeing new places. Um, it kind of makes me sound, when I hear myself say that, it makes me sound like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of done with life. It's not that, but it really is a kind of shedding of some of the things that used to be important. And I'm gonna have to say free time uh, or not having so much that I'm interested in and, and just being in kind of a flow is such, um, for me, a wonderful relief because I was such a busy person in, uh, especially my thirties and forties. Uh, I think it slowed down a little bit in my fifties, but I, I was such a super achiever, always doing something. And um, I, I'm going to have to say, this is the life that I always used to dream of. More of a peaceful, not too many demands. I still have lots of work coming at me, but um, just a, a little, little more yogic. I used to dream of kind of just of being a yogi or just meditating in a cabin. And there's really uh, a different feeling now of relaxation than when I was so young. So been there, done that. It's not that bad of a thing. And as far as even, even the looks thing, even losing beauty, um, people, a number of people, I see, I see this on, on the internet a lot, but also friends or acquaintances, women will say, uh, you know, we're kind of invisible now. And it's, and it's a complaint. You know, nobody pays attention to me anymore. When I was younger, I used to get all this attention. And try this on for yourself. Maybe some of you women have, have, have had that thought. And, and I want to, I don't want to not take it seriously. I want to leave space to, to kind of feel sad and, and you know, those were different days. Those were different times. But for me, it really is a relief not to be so visible. Uh, yeah, it's a different perspective. That's mine. Now, one, one more issue that's in my lifestyle list, the kind of issues, are this question of, how much I give to others or how much I attend to the needs of others versus attending to my own needs. There's gonna be a new balance point that's probably going to be required on this issue. Certainly for me and, and for a lot of my friends, it takes more of our own time and energy to just stay healthy. And yet at the same time, there's a lot of our friends who are getting ill and needing help and needing us to bring meals and um, visit because they've just had uh, no surgery or something like that. So it's a, it, it's, a tough, it's, a, it's a tough balance right now for a lot of us. We talk about this in my uh, female group. Uh, geez, the men usually aren't involved in this. Why is that? I just realized that. Uh, Maybe they have their own conversations about it. I'll have to ask my partner. But um, it's like, man, just when the needs for my giving are going up, my also my needs for receiving are going up. So somehow finding a new balance and saying no more often, it does. It 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 has been a bit of a challenge for me and a number of my friends. I often. I don't know, it's kind of a joke. I say to my friends, you know, I'm a bad friend. I just, I can't keep up with hardly anybody's needs but my own right now. And there is, there is a kind of resignation and sadness in that as I look at it. So are you willing to say no when you need to? Of course, that's an issue that people deal with all their lives. But if you've gotten pretty good at that when you're younger, I just want to say that would be great because it gets it gets harder. At least in my in my friend group, it's it's quite a bit harder now to figure out and to feel okay. I guess a, a lot of my identity at an earlier stage was being a, 
a resource, a giver. And um, I'm receiving a lot right now. But I guess for me, it's not like healthcare receiving, but I used to be the one who had all the parties and who did all the dinners in my crowd. And now I'm much more of going to somebody else's house, that sort of thing. And it's nice. Max, I, I, I welcome that. So now I want to um, talk about the inner development issues. And one of the biggest ones is coming to terms with the hand I was dealt. And what comes up when you even think about that? Like certain gifts that you were born with, just advantages that you were born into. You had certain disadvantages that you may have been born into. How are you doing with that? I'm, I'm going to read off a few self-reflection questions here so that you can use this for your own inner looking Have you faced the truth about your early life? What comes up when I say that? Were there dysfunctions in your family of origin that you don't like to think about or look at? Probably with this crowd, not so much. But still, let's be with this for a minute. Do I suspect that I may be in denial about the dysfunction of my family or the adverse childhood experiences that I may have experienced? So this is all about coming to terms with the hand you were dealt. Have I grieved these lacks? And here's something I want to say about my psychotherapy practice. So many people did suffer early wounds from basic developmental needs not being well enough met. The needs for touch, for feeling loved and accepted and appreciated and safe. So some of those needs might not have been well enough. I can't say fully met because that usually doesn't happen. But well enough met. Have I grieved that? Have I touched in to that sense of wow? If that hadn't been my handicap, what might I have been able to do or at least to do much more easily? So most of my psychotherapy patients who have early dysfunction in their families usually come to a point where spontaneously, I don't, I don't preach this, but spontaneously, it's like, wow, this is so sad that that little kid who had all, 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 all that juice and all that love in his heart, but he he didn't have guidance. He didn't have support. He was sort of left to flip-flop on his own. And therefore, he kind of always felt like an imposter. He, he never had much confidence. Wow. What could he have done with those basic talents and that loving heart if he'd had a little more environmental support? So it's stuff like that that comes up with. I would say about three quarters of my clients. So it's um, something you can do on your own as well, even if you're not doing psychotherapy. Grief is a coming to terms with. Another part of coming to terms with though is the gratitude for the gift of life and for what you were given. and. I, I see people who have what childhoods, let's say that I would not want to trade places with them, but they're so grateful 
for just something about one of their parents who taught them something really important. Oh, my father taught me to love literature, or my father taught, taught me to live from my heart. Oh, and he was an alcoholic and he was unreliable and he and my mother fought all the time, but he taught me about having a loving heart, just the same. So gratitude for what was there. So I hear a lot of that too in my psychotherapy practice. So we're just reflecting. Have I come to terms enough with the hand I was dealt? Do I accept it or do I kind of resent certain things? Probably all, all of us are still in the process. Like I'm I'm still, I'm writing my autobiography here. I'm I'm still kind of in question about is there is there almost like is there something that I didn't get that really did limit me? I'm looking at now my birth. I was a breech birth. My body came out before my head. And I haven't looked into that enough to know, is that like a birth trauma? And does that make me kind of anxious or unable to really get a full breath sometimes? Because lately in older age, I have had um, breathing issues. I do want to say for some of you, I think there's only a few of you here who read my newsletter, but I, I, I want to give you a personal update for, for my friends here. In my newsletter, I've written a couple of times about how I'll probably die from a heart attack because I have this out of breath issue and it feels like I'm just going to you know, go out if I push myself and don't rest. Well, that's gone pra practically now. So that was true for me for about three years. I had this condition where I would get real out of breath for no reason for like about five times a day. And now it's happening like about one time a week. And so I just want to say, you know, you never know. You know, I'm thinking, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably gonna die in the next few years. Now I don't feel that so much anymore. So I may be around for a, a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> so maybe I will travel some more and, and do some things that I th thought that I didn't care about. We'll see. So now the question, how I played my hand. And uh, I, I, my mother had this poem that somehow inspired me to take seriously how you play your hand. And she would recite this to me probably from about the age of five. My mother was really into poetry and literature and she would collect sayings from Shakespeare and great American poets and Rumi and so forth in a little notebook where she typed these things out. But here's, here's the one that comes to me when I think of how did you play the hand you were dealt? Isn't it strange how princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings and common folks like you and me are builders of eternity each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, and a book of rules. And each must make, ere life is flown, a stumbling block or a stepping stone. Now, it's just this cute little sweet poem that a child would kind of understand. And it's that kind of inspiration that has me wanting to ask us, what did we do with the shapeless mass that we were given? Of course, it wasn't completely shapeless. As we said, there are certain givens, but how did we work with the givens? Do we have mostly self-appreciation? Now in um, Eric Erickson's eight stages <clears throat> of adult development, the eighth stage of life, he calls integrity versus despair. And it's basically the question, did I get wiser? Did I make some kind of contribution 
in this life or did I kind of waste my life? I mean, he doesn't say that, but that's the despair part. If I can't find any, any meaning or value at this last stage of life, if I can't appreciate something about what I've done with what I was given, then I'll, I'll, then I'll have despair. Otherwise, I'll have a kind of what he calls integrity. But he also mentions, and, I, and this has been true of me too, that you sort of flip-flop during this last stage, you sort of flip-flop if you're evaluating how you've, how you've done. Did I have a good life? You flip-flopped from integrity to despair to integrity to despair, or from, yeah, I did okay to mm, maybe not, that sort of thing. So I am, as I write this autobiography that I'm working on, I am really looking at, did, did I... Did I do enough? I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's kind of a sweet question. I, I appreciate myself for having this, this question. I wouldn't have anticipated this when I was younger, but it's like, did I do enough with what I was given? I, I was gifted so much. Wasn't I maybe a little bit lazy with it? Did I work hard enough? Those, those, are, those are real for me. And I think they deserve a little more contemplation. So um, the fact of writing this story, or this life story, um, allows me to kind of slow down and feel into some of the experiences that I may have kind of gone through fairly quickly. Like in my 30s and 40s, I mentioned I was so busy um, working and contributing, and being out there and gathering new experiences. Uh, I think some of it was a blur at the time, but when I sit down to write, details are coming back to me, feelings of how I felt at that moment when that was going on between me and a mentor or somebody that I was mentoring, you, you know, the, the, the deeper aspects of some of these relationships where it almost felt like I was just getting from one appointment to the next at the time. But I realized, you know, I really was present. But maybe, maybe not as present as I could have been. And this is helping me go back and almost like correct that. Because it's the impressions are there somewhere. So I just really want to recommend doing a sort of life review like I'm doing right now. And I'll be doing this now probably till the end of my life. I don't know when this book will be finished. I gave myself three months, but it's not like it's going to, I have any illusion that I can do this in three months because I'm so enjoying the process of just taking my time and going into this chapter and that chapter. And right now they all seem kind of disjointed, but eventually, and then this is that integrity piece in your final stage of life it, that, that assumes a kind of integration I intuitively feel like there's a there there is a there are principles or there's ways that this all integrates that this all fits into a whole, but I'm not able to articulate that at this point, and I'm not going to rush it. So back to um, self self appreciation for you. Do you appreciate what do you appreciate about? how you've how you've done your life a couple other questions did you put in more than you took out that's a question of mind did i put in enough did i you know did i was i too much of a consumer not necessarily of material things cuz uh I, I i wasn't oriented toward materialism ever um again probably due to who I was born into, it just, we were much more service oriented as a family, much more um, learning and growth oriented as a family. So, you know, I came by that kind of naturally. I didn't have to like have a crisis and then go, oh, I better grow. It's always been kind of a, a theme for me. I'll mention it, you know, my parents. My parents, 
okay, they they were born in 1911 and 1918. Okay, that's long. That's a long, long time ago. But they were reading when I was in. Um, well, at between ages of like 10 to to getting out of high school, they were reading books like Summerhill, which is about alternative education, child-centered education, um, Krishnamurti, The World's Great Religions, The Tao Te Ching. And they had this one book that they used to quote from a lot. It was titled Your Inner Child of the Past. And this was the 50s. And some of you are my peers and you, um, you know what was going on in the culture in the 50s not much in terms of personal awareness and personal growth, at least not in the sort of mainstream. And we weren't in some kind of alternative spiritual community or anything like that. They were pretty mainstream. My father had a corporate job. My mother just raised us uh, four kids. But um, they were always quoting things like, you know, quoting the author, you know, in every marriage bed, there's not just the husband and wife, there's the husband and his mother and father and there's the wife and her mother and father you know like, like I was getting fed this stuff when I was a teenager so how could I not be grateful for that so in a way should I be appreciating myself or should I just be appreciating the hand I was dealt because I just got given so much that it was easy to um just take that I didn't I didn't have much conflict with, um, with the values of my childhood um, growing up family. Of course, every, every person has to work out attachment to ego and image and self-identity. And, and we all have to either consciously or not so consciously work out who am I really and that sort of thing so um my parents didn't do that for me and I think growing old does that for you growing old confronts you with who am I really look at all these identifications that have defined who I am my beauty my job my physique my health and what if all those are gone who am I so that's the that's the inner development piece. I want to bring a few more questions into the room here. Uh, is there grief over what you didn't actualize? Or if you even think about that, like I like, what would I have grief over then? What? What wasn't I able to learn or actualize or heal? Uh, I'll tell you one thing about my answer to that question. I have this thing, this mental pattern of um, when I'm giving a speech or teaching in any way, uh, too much comes into my mind and I'm sorting out Oh, should I should I go in this direction or that direction or that direction? And I I don't have that so much socially. Or if maybe I'm giving like a getting real workshop where I've delivered the material thousands of times. But if it's anything that's a little bit new, I tend to get overwhelmed. It's sort of an internal TMI, too much information. And it 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 creates a lack of presence and a kind of anxiety that I'm I'm aware of in the moment. And so then being aware of that, plus all the, oh, should I talk about this or that or that, that would be something that I haven't been able to master in this life. And I've, I've been aware of it for a long time and, and I've consciously looked at it and worked on it and so forth. But I, I just wanna say, I think there's just, just some things that you're, you're gonna die with not able, I wasn't able to heal that. And I'm not even sure what it's about. But as you hear me, do you have anything like that? You know, anything that, you know, it's, it's just, it's always been with me and I don't think I'm going to be able to shake it before I die.
And one more thing I want to say about um, coming to terms with the, the hand, the, the way you played the hand that you were dealt. I mentioned earlier that I still have that question. Uh, did I have a good life or was it good enough? Did I play my hand well enough? Uh, is there more I could be doing? I guess that should be on there too. And um, I kind of think we all need to feel like we did have a good life in some way. We, we, it's maybe it's an ego need, um, but it's still it's there. And I'm um, I'm just remembering a sweet moment with my brother Bruce, who I said died uh, he died two summers ago actually from kidney failure. Um, my two other brothers were with him at the time. I was out here in California and they were in Tennessee and they phoned me so I could have some last words with Bruce. And it was like, he was about to lose his ability to communicate. They could see that. So Bruce and I had a little talk and he, he, he had abused his health quite a bit. That's why he had the kidney failure. And he made, I would say, some other poor decisions in my judgment uh, in terms of how he used his time and money and so forth. But he, he he was a great guy and he was always very giving and to the family and to others and so forth. And he was extremely clever and talented. OK, so he had, you know, he had a lot of wonderful qualities. But in the end, I, I just said to him, Bruce, you had a good life. And he repeated that. And he wasn't quite able to talk in his normal, functional way, but he said back to me, yes, I had a good life, however, you know, a little slurred. And that seemed to bring him so much peace, just saying that. And it was a moment between us, and it was something that I could give to him, even though I probably felt that in my heart but in my mind had all these except that you you know made a couple of really bad decisions my friend you know um but I think I was pretty wholehearted when I said it and out of that it's just such a wonderful memory that I could kind of give him that and it has left me with that feeling that yeah I think we all probably want to die feeling that way and there's always some way that you can help yourself feel that or help another person feel that. If you have the occasion, and this is something I, I did want to mention to people oh, probably later on in my notes here, but I want to bring it in now. If you have the opportunity to sit with somebody when they're dying or to be more or less present during the last weeks of somebody's life, it's a great opportunity, and I urge you to seek out those opportunities. If I mean, if they are, if they come naturally, not not to avoid them. There's just so so much depth at that last stage of life. Sharing that with somebody, I didn't share a lot of it with my brother, but I did share uh, the last two weeks or so of my parents' life with both of them, and I mean. Every every death is different, but my father um, let me like get in bed with him and hold him and read to him um, when I was when he was constipated. I even played nurse and got the poop out of him of his body. He let me do that. I mean, it it was like he was my baby, and um, I don't expect people get that kind of opportunity necessarily and that isn't even the essence of of what I got from being around him I, I can't even describe what it is but him dying and then feeling something in the room and I don't even know what I believe about um your spirit living on after your body I I don't have a firm belief about that but certainly in that room for a few days where he died I could feel him. I could, well, I could feel something. I don't know what I felt, but um, 
have, having those, and then I had then I had a um, experience with my then boyfriend's mother dying, and I was very close with her, and especially those last three days, the whole family was around, and one of her issues was, was she kept going back and forth between the let's call it the two worlds, and she was having a lot of trouble. She was 101, by the way, and she was really ready to die. And she and she was almost like she was like grunting and said, I can't do this. And I mean, where do you get those experiences? Like I'm describing that level of intimacy with somebody. So um, I'm just encouraging you to, uh, seek out those opportunities if they show up for you. And now I want to um, look at the, the next place here. Seems like we've been going quite a while here, but I don't know if you need a break, just, just take a break. I'm, I'm not gonna offer a break. Um, I'm just looking at the chat here just to read a few. Yeah, accompanied people in their last stages. And I feel this is one of the biggest privileges of life. Yes, Kathy, how fortunate we are. And um, also Flora, hospice clients. And by the way, so many of my uh, friends who are still maybe 10 years younger than me and who are still pretty capable, uh, like at least a, a couple of them, for example, they, they used to be midwives and now they're death doulas. You know, like that's something that that you can do until you're like super old, and um, th that isn't necessarily you have to train for that. But I and hospice you have to train for. But if you have any interest in this kind of thing at all, I I, don't, I mean I would probably do it maybe if I'm a little bit older and have completed the other stuff that I'm here to do. I, I don't feel like I've quite completed everything I'm um, here to do yet in terms of just my teaching. But um, it's a very appealing, it's a very appealing uh, vocation or avocation. So um, one of the things on the list that I see when I'm out reading about the final stage of life is what people call loss of meaning. So then that brings up what, what did give your life meaning if you're losing it. Again, for most of us who are here, that's probably not, uh, it's not quite, you're not quite there yet. I, I don't get that that's this population. But um, perhaps some of you have had to leave careers because of health issues or leave some aspect of what you used to give to the world, you're not able to offer that anymore. Again, probably because of uh, something going on in your health. And um, so that's a big source of meaning, right? It's, it's our vocation. But then, okay, who am I without my vocation? So this, these, these are the, the deeper currents of all these losses are wow, when I surrender that and when I'm just uh, alone in my bed, just being, who am I now? Does my life have meaning? Or maybe what we can say is um, I've had a meaningful life. You can say that. And in a sense, I'm now opening up to other forms of meaning that I kind of haven't quite formed yet. You know, there's like transition. I've let go of what I used to think was meaningful and it was at the time. Now I'm not sure what's next. So that's again, one of these developments, ability to be in transition, to let go of the old and not know what's coming next. That's one of the things that people, I think, try to learn in their earlier adult years. And so just keep that in mind uh, that that's that that'll come up again. 
And now the question, if I look back on my life, what's left unfinished? And I did mention that one of the things for me that's left unfinished is this too much information coming at me and not having uh, good mental skills for shutting out some of that information and just focusing. Um, so still, still haven't mastered that. And I joke with a lot of my groups because, you know, we'll have these, I call them honesty salons, but they're like encounter groups and people will have issues with each other and give each other feedback. It's that kind of a group. And you'll walk out of the door having unfinished business with something you said or something that was said to you. So I always joke with my groups. I say, well, you know, you'll die with unfinished business. So, you know, we're not going to get closure on everything at the end of each session. So that's my little lighthearted um, lesson there. But now I'm taking that one, applying it to myself and going, yep, I'm probably going to die with this piece of unfinished business. So I ask you, what unfinished business, if you died tomorrow, what unfinished business would you be dying with? Just give it a moment here. And can that, can you accept it? Maybe it's unfinished business in terms of things you haven't expressed to somebody. And if that person is alive, is it appropriate to finish that, to have completion conversations with your parents, for example? Now, the way I like to do completion conversations is um, I think it's a little different than what they teach in EST or radical honesty and so forth. What I usually, depending on the situation, how about if you just, let's say you, you have an aging parent. Okay, let's say it's your mother. And um, what if you go back and visit your mom and you say, mom, could we have a conversation about what it was like for you to have me as a kid know what you remember about being my mom and how I was and um, what you remember about our relationship and that and I'll also tell you how it was being your kid and you know reflect back we'll reflect back together on some of the moments we shared together both good and bad would you want to do that with me so you, of course you set a context you invite your parent into it but that is so low threat and it really can connect people and give you the a kind of kind of a heart centered way of completing your unfinished business saying the stuff you needed to say to your mom but it's in a context of i want you to know this about me and i'm curious about you and now that i've said that i want to know how that impacts you so of course these are the skills i i've been teaching all my life um, but they really can be used well in if you have unfinished conversations, or it could be a sibling that abused you, or things that just that that same conversation could could be shared there, or with a a friend that you've lost touch with, but you reach back out to them because you've got some kind of wondering, well, what happened there? I've had guys reach out to me and go, why why didn't you like me? It's kind of funny because like a, a lot of the people that um, that I was sort of not lovers with, but guys who were um, had a crush on me. And since because there was a 10 year age difference, I wasn't that into them when I was 30. You know, um, I had an age prejudice, but there was a period where some of them were dying. I mean, most of them are dead now, uh, but um, go. I would get letters or phone calls saying, you know, why, can you tell me again why you didn't like me or why you didn't choose me? And I, I, uh, I almost always say, didn't we cover that at the time? Didn't we talk about that? Because I'm pretty good at um, answering those kinds of questions on the spot. Uh, but I have, to, I have to honor them for doing that. Like you can do that? Yes. You guys can do that, male or female, what you know, however, um, 
if that if there's any of that and and i now that i'm describing that i have to think is there any like old lover or anything that i want to reach out to and just kind of go what was it like for you or any of that uh, i'm gonna have to chew on that for a while because that's that's only that's not something i plan to to discuss here with you today but unfinished business if you sit with that question long enough i i bet you if i sit with it i'll, I'll probably have a few relationships at least where I go, yeah, this could use one final good disclosure sh sharing session. Yeah. If you value that sort of thing. And the idea, the idea here is being intentional about how you want to live this final stage of life. Do you even value all the things that I'm speaking about? I, I kind of assume you do value most of these things. So what else is left unfinished when I look at my own life? Well, you know, something comes up for me and a number of you are kind of my age, slightly younger. Um, we came of age in the 60s and 70s. And our generation had an agenda for the world. And I was one of those people, you know, anti-war protests, civil rights marches, um, environment, environmental activism before it was a thing, because a lot of us could see what was going on in terms of corporate America taking, taking over the forests and uh, polluting the, the rivers and this and that. Of course, it's much, we're much more sophisticated about the complexities of, of all this now, but um, we had an agenda, our generation, and I still identify with that agenda, like eliminating war, eliminating racism, eliminating sexism, economic justice, some of those, some of those important social things that, um, Basically, there's been progress in some areas, regression in other areas. I mean, I fought for uh, abortion rights, um, and we got it, you know, in the in the early '70s, and 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 now look what's happening. So, I'm some of me, a portion of me is identified with the generational agenda, and you you represent different generations here. Did your, do you feel like your generation had an agenda for making the world healthier? And how, how are we doing with that? So I feel a lot of unfinished business around that one. Um, and that's one I'll probably die with. And I'll die sad about that. Now, um, I want to get to more some of the more practical things, just sort of things that I've been dealing with that most people don't, they don't think of them as developmental tasks. I wouldn't even think of these as developmental tasks, but they're sort of things you might want to think about. And that is um, having a plan for the for the dying part and the after you die part that helps your survivors a plan like a will or a trust and i i i actually went into i went into my um little box here that has all my vital papers and the the deed to my house and you know notes that i hold for loans that i've given to people and so forth so what i i got this one list comes from the patient's guide to advanced directives. So if you want to know all the different paperwork, pieces of paperwork that you need to deal with, preferably before you die, some of it is your, um, your survivors will have to deal with this, like death certificate and stuff like that. But you know, there's a shitload of paperwork uh, if you really want to do it right, and I haven't finished all this stuff yet. There's durable power of attorney for health care. There's a li living will. There's um, 
guardianship or conservatorship. That's if you if you have a, a child or something like that. A durable power of attorney for finances, insurance policies. And then there's something you give to your physician, which is called the Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, HOLST. Um, your doctor, my, I had to file this with my doctor. My doctor wanted me to give her um, a copy of this, but it basically says, uh, oh, I don't, I don't want um, to be kept alive on a feeding tube or artificially kept alive. And then I have to um, define what are the things that I consider uh, like too disabled to want to live. Like if I can't digest my own food, you know, I wrote that on the list. There's a bunch of these things. And, you know, some of the, some of the questions like, you know, do you want music at your memorial? Do you want to have a memorial? Some of that stuff I don't really care about, but people who are going to survive me, they want to know that stuff. I'm, I'm having conversations with family members and friends about all of this now. And more and more people our age are doing things like that. You know, just having frank conversations or, you know, giving my brothers copies of my will and my partner and so forth. So all of this is like just being thoughtful about leaving any messes behind or leaving any things that you're um, survivors could have conflicts about. Um, for a while, my partner said, I don't really care what you do with my body. You no, know, he said, but I don't want to be cremated. He said, because I saw somebody, I saw cremation once and I don't want to be cremated. So I don't care. And, I, and my, and his sister and I go, you know, we need a little more specificity, please. <laughs> you know, because that's, there could be like, why spend time deciding that after, when the, after he's dead and we want to put our attention on our hearts and, and there's enough paperwork and practical shit to deal with um, that I didn't know about 10 years ago. So let's try to make it a little easier for your survivors. And then there's this thing called the five wishes, which just articulates a little more about how you want your body to be handled. Do you want you know, special friends to wash your body and there's you know have to do with more of the the ritual aspects the music um like i said the memorial and some things like that if you want that um and my parents had everything handled and i remember on, on her deathbed my mother she hadn't dealt with the obituary because you know somebody else usually writes your obituary although she says to me susan Will you help me write my obituary? And so we said she's in the, she died in the hospital. Um, so we laid there on her bed and we constructed her obituary. And it was just one of the sweetest things. So those are the kind of things that um, some of us don't think about. And I know many people who don't think about what's going to happen to your stuff. And um, I want to give you guys some tips so I mean I'm cleaning out my stuff as best I can but there's for sure going to be things in my house that nobody wants that I haven't said who sh who it should go to and I am hiring I haven't selected who to hire yet but there are services that you can pay to come into your house and you say everything in the attic or everything in this closet or however you want to organize that that's just going to go. What's it going to charge me? What are you going to charge me? And um, the last time I had somebody in around that, it was like 700 bucks. It's not that much to get it handled before you die. Now, it's still, like I said, it's not going to be fully handled. But I, these, are, these are what an adult does. That's what I want to say. And, and I definitely have friends. Um, who are saying, you know, that's going to be somebody else's problem. I don't have the bandwidth to deal with that. And, and so, okay, okay, that's your choice. But um, I just kind of wanted to, want to mention that. And I sort of resent, <laughs> I sort of resent that there's all these 
all this paperwork and things like that. But, you know, I'm doing it. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go through a, a few other, what I call other helpful practices. And um, certainly, if you're a meditator or have some kind of a mindfulness practice, this whole loss thing that happens toward the end will be a lot easier. You'll find it interesting to watch things fall away. I mean, I, I, I have found it interesting to, to watch my skin tone. I mean, that's the main thing that's obvious in me is um, up until a couple of years ago, I, I kind of looked normal. Now I have sag, everything's sagging. And, and that is extremely interesting for a person who used to be pretty identified with her physical body. Um, it's just, okay, there's that. And it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't have anything other than a noticing because somehow where I come from now, um, through years of mindfulness practice and meditation, I'm more interested in, uh, in, the, in the interestingness of it or the, oh, look at that, you know, like, like, ah, so type of thing. So those are things you can do while you're younger that will make this whole like surrender into just being and not having um, that old self that you used to have, making that more of a value and um, a joy. And I, I, I was listening to a YouTube thing um just this morning by this 97 year old man you, you, some of you may have seen it or you might be interested in it so i'll tell you about it it's it's his name was um what is his name vig vin vig Nuret, like herbert let me see if i've got his name here oh, Finnegret, Herbert Finnegret. Um, I don't, F I N A G R E T T E. And he's 97 and he's a professor, former professor, author of many books. And um, he, he says something that's really touched me and that's inspiring me. He said, you know, now if I sit out in my yard and just look at the tree, the tree in my yard that I planted 30 years ago. And I just look at the tree. And I just have that experience. And I realize all the years that I was doing my teaching and my writing and my achieving, I never really sat with the tree. I never experienced the beauty of that relationship, me and the tree. And so so I says to myself after I see this video, yeah, I'm just I am just beginning to kind of sit in my yard. I used to walk. I mean, I still walk in my yard and look around at the beauty, but I'm I'm going to spend a little more time just sitting with one of the trees or the flowers or the bushes. That I think will kind of prepare me maybe uh, to find the kind of joy that he's finding when his body is pretty much almost gone, let's just say. So um, that's one helpful practice is, is mindfulness and meditation. And uh, another thing that I want to say that is more true if you're a little bit younger, that it's never too late. I mean, it's never too early. I want to say it this way. It's never too early to have a midlife crisis. And what I mean by a midlife crisis is to kind of time out. Let me look at my life. Let me do a life review. See, I'm, I'm modeling that. I'm doing it at my age now. But I actually had three midlife crises when I was younger. I had one when I was 35, and I took a year off from teaching at UMass, leave without pay. It's like a sabbatical. But you have to apply for it and justify it, but you just don't get paid. So. And I took a, a year off to, I'm going to say just be, to just kind of see who am I without all my professional roles. So that was well, way back then. I'm sort of anticipating 
um, not identifying so much with um, the avatar, Susan Campbell, the professional. So I took a year off then. I took another year off when I was um, 42 to go sailing for two years. So by then I wasn't teaching at the university anymore, but I went sailing um, in the South Pacific and was just really close to nature. And that was another life review that also had to do with being versus doing. I guess that's been a, a constant balancing thing for me. Uh, so just being in nature without any um, job or any agenda. And then um, when I was 50, I also, I didn't, I didn't take a year off, but I um, had another um, big transition. So um, my last midlife crisis was 58, what that? 40, 30 years ago. So I haven't needed one since then. <laughs> if you have them when you're young, I don't know, it just gets to be a little bit more of a part of my life. I think by that time, I could take little times off. I didn't need the one year and the two year times off. Um, I could take just a little time off, like three months this summer, to do that reflection and that integration. Because I, I don't recommend you leave it all till the final stage. And an, another useful practice is what I call practicing dying. And if you've had psychedelics, and if you've kind of experienced the complete uh, dissolution of the self, that can be simulated without psychedelics. Uh, in fact, a lot of times it happens to people spontaneously. Um, like breath work is a way, meditation is a way, and and um, my particular favorite psychedelic is uh, the DMT, the the toad substance. And um, I haven't done a whole lot of psychedelics actually, um, but I had a few DMT experiences in the in the last ten years. That's basically about it. Um, I want to do more. I guess that would be one of my big regret, regrets or something like that is like, my, I should have done more psychedelics. You know, some people will say, you know, I shouldn't have worked so hard or I should have had more friends or something. But I think mine, the only one that's coming to me right now is, and that I can, that I can correct, you know, and I plan to. But all I needed really was this one DMT experience to give me a complete dissolution of any Susan Campbellness or any bodiness or any personality, any any personness, and um, I would just say join the universal flow. And what I came away with was a complete trust in life. Like I can let go, and life goes on. Uh, I don't know if it's with or without me because there it wasn't an important question. It was a complete, like, oh, I'm gone. And I have enjoyed turning on that same bit of music that my shaman used when guiding me in that DMT trip. I mean, I don't have to have the music, but the music really helps. So I got, I got that. And I can just lie in my bed for maybe 15 minutes and I call it practicing dying. And it's blissful. And I don't know if it's going to help me make the transition easier or not. It's not, I don't have that necessarily as my intention, but I, I think it could, you know, like, wouldn't it be nice when you think about how do you want to actually have the moment of your death be, I don't, I don't want to promote that we should be able to control that, but I just still feel like, wouldn't it be nice if I could just like, okay, it's time. Poof. I don't know if anybody else identifies with any of that stuff that I'm saying. Let me hear, let me see show hands. I see a few nods and stuff like that. Uh, it's, it's what some of us are attracted to. Let's just put it that way. And uh, 
it's enjoyable. So um, I think maybe I want to wrap it there and have a bit of discussion, Q and A. If there was anything that I that I said that you want me to elaborate on, or I'd honestly really like to hear some of your own shares about some of the stuff that I named or shared about. So, um, F has uh, Flora has a hand up. So uh, let's start with Flora. Hi, Flora. You got your sound on. Well, I could get your sound. Uh, I could get. You, I could unmute you, or maybe your hand. Oh, let's let's go ahead and hear from Karen because uh, Flora's uh, not responding. Karen, hi. Hi, Susan. What a pleasant, happy surprise to see you when I thought I wouldn't see you for three months. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, gosh, wow, what what an immensely thought provoking conversation you've created inside of me and and your authentic sharing just touches my heart so much. I work with people who want to die at home. Mm -hmm. And I all the things that you're saying about getting things in order and having the paperwork and like it it's it's all right in my face because I work with people who don't have it. <laughs> And I work with people, I work with people who do have it. It's so interesting. And I can't say how much it matters because of the last dear beloved of mine who passed and how he had, we could, there was nothing obvious left behind. And what went down was so the opposite of what his, what I knew of him and what he would want and how he lived and but the people who came in and who had the say so they didn't and it was mind-boggling how rapid the difference was between what he was and what they were and what they thought so i can only say please people <laughs> you know it was something but i you know what i wrote down that mattered to me in this conversation was um how do i want to live them any whatever amount of time i have left how do i want to live my life mm. and That's i'm going to take that away from this conversation and i wrote it in my journal right here with my pretty pencils and I'm going to really chew on that and really let it kind of be a, a, a marker to walk forward with, you know, it's really, yeah, it really provoked this, this really, this beingness inside of me about, yeah, we don't know, none of us knows how much life we have left. We don't know what day of our life we're living right now. And I want to live in that place about like, yeah, how do I want to live it? And, and I appreciate you so much for bringing the conversation to the table today, Susan. I really do. Thank you, Karen. Go ahead, David. Unmute yourself. Okay. Yes. Um, quite a journey. Uh, like I said in the text, can't wait to watch this again because there were many places that mm, I'd say deepened my Oh, my understanding or my places to explore for sure. Um, uh, when I, when you went through those, that list of things that you're afraid of, I found myself raising my hand each time, almost like I could feel it inside of me each time. And some of them, I didn't really realize I was afraid of until you asked the question. And I thought, oh, 
And I told him, what does this mean? And I don't know. But um, but the the flip side of it, which was what do I appreciate? I really started getting touched. Now there is where I started to cry. And I um, was really, it kind of showed me what I value the most. Um, and I, the, the place where the, some of the things you reminded me of is um, helping other people to manage or, or to get insights into their own lives, which is really coming from a place of, I'm so grateful for those people that have done so much skill building, if you will, um, because it's really made me feel um, much more connected in the world in general and much more hopeful. And I think I want to say also, I'm just like you. I have, I feel like I really want to change the world still. And which is kind of really more for young people, but I'm even more determined now than ever. And, and I feel like that inspiration is what keeps me alive or not. Um, I think it's a, it's a result of my being so alive. Mm. Mm. So um, there's much that you said that um, I'm going to chew on and, and uh, just, but thank, thanks to all the people for raising their hand uh, because I felt like that was teaching me something. I wasn't alone. I felt, I felt like then I was connected to everybody in this conversation. Thank, I don't know you. Where Thank you. And Ryan. Hey, Susan, thanks so much for this presentation. It was, it was great, thought provoking. Um, one of the things that I'm definitely going to take away is uh, have I done everything I I can in this life with the opportunities that have been given me? And, you know, I know I've got some fear in those spaces. And so I really appreciate that question and uh, leaning in to those opportunities and the gifts that are in there. Um, and that inquiry with uh, about the little child, you know, like what was happening with that little child? What if that little child was supported a little more? Uh, what gif gifts could come out of that? So that was real, real sweet for me. Um, and then I just really want to second the uh, getting things in order. I've worked as an ICU nurse for many years and then uh, quit ICU and moved over to hospice work um, for several years. I don't do either of those things anymore. But that transition was really facilitated by people coming into the hospital, not having their things in order. Um, and then having uh, care that was really not necessary provided to them. In, uh, and it's a, it's a bad place to be if you haven't really lined things up. So I just can't um, stress that enough. And that's the book that I got from my parents was I'm dead, now what? Uh, it's a workbook for uh, end of life. Thank you very um, much. And it's, it's pretty good. Uh, and then, yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah. So yeah. thanks so much. Thanks for that resource. Mm. Yeah. Susan, Bill has his hand raised. Oh, okay. Bill, hi. Nice to see you, Bill. Uh, we can't hear you, Bill. We can't hear you. Oh, he said the Zoom is cutting out a bit. So he put his hand up and then things blanked for a minute. So maybe that's all we get from you, Bill. Um, if if you want to um, say something, um, try again right now. Okay, we're not we're getting the mouth moving, but we're not getting the sound. Okay, we'll let that go. Oh, 
Okay. So I just want to close perhaps by, um, but interrupt me if, if uh, you got something to share here by saying that this has given me a lot of food for thought, just working on this. And I probably have more questions now after thinking about it all day before coming on here and then hearing you guys. I probably have more questions now than I had before I even started looking at this. So I hope this has prompted some inner exploration and questions and uh, possibly new ideas for you. And thank you so much for coming here today with me. Yeah. Thank you so much, dear Susan Campbell. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan. Let's give uh, Susan a round of applause. Uh, beautiful session uh, today. Uh, very heartwarming. And as the youngest person in the room, too, it's... Um, it was uh, humbling because I haven't thought much about this and it's, it's um, encouraging me to build a relationship with the future Peter and uh, you know do those things, perhaps do a psychedelic or two. Um, uh, before we close uh, today's uh, session, um, there's gonna be a follow-up. Uh, um, Emergent Commons is a really cool community. They're gonna have a follow-up uh, conversation on a different link. Um, Mari, would you like to uh, um, plug that where, where people can find it? Yeah, so I just put the link in the chat and um, we'll just take a brief uh, bio break and then we can go into that room and, and uh, kind of reflect on anything that might have come up, what's alive. And Susan, I know you're a, you're a member of Emergent Commons. You're more than welcome to join us if you like. We would love that if you're interested. I'd like to. I'd like to. I'd like to hear what's coming out for people because I'm... I'm a learner at this stage as much as I've always ever been. Thanks. Yeah. So it's going to be right on the same Zoom link then. It's I put it in the chat. You can oh, I see it. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. If you copy it, if you if you click on the link right now, you'll just go directly there and you'll leave this. You'll leave this oh, Zoom I'm just saying so you no. Know. I'm gonna copy it and um, mm -hmm. and I'll put it in a Word doc or something here if I can. <laughs> so I'll I'll uh, close down and leave this uh, Zoom room open so people can copy that link. But uh, Susan, everyone, thanks so much for coming to the Stoa today. <laughs>